Welcome everyone to the second session of today, which where we'll go back to Arcu Genetics. And I'm very happy to introduce Sandra and Irina to you, who are both working in the microbiome group in the department of Arcu Genetics. So take it away. Yeah, hi, thank you everyone. Uh, it's good to be here and we will today be talking to you about the most exciting part of archaeological sciences, in our humble opinion, which is microbial archaeology. And we are Sandra and Irina, like uh, Selina just mentioned. And just to introduce us a little bit, my colleague here, Irina, is a postdoc. She already has a PhD in microbiology. Uh, she mainly works with dental calculus, and she's one of the few people here who also work with living and modern things. So she also knows about living microbes a lot. And she is and has been working with uh, genetics, proteomics, and metabolomics. So really wide knowledge of everything microbial, basically. And me, I am trying to get a PhD in microbiology, should be submitting hopefully very soon. I also work mainly with dental calculus, and my PhD has had a lot of lab work in it. So that's really where my expertise lies. And I've been doing both genetics and proteomics. Then let's get started. So why would we want to study microbes when there are things like humans and animals that are really cool and charismatic in the archaeological record? Well, that's because we can learn a lot about the human past from microbes. We can learn about health and disease, for example, like past pandemics that we perhaps can use to study pandemics to learn a bit of better what to do in future pandemics. We can learn about diet, uh, different cultural practices like food preparation, just in general, we can get a very holistic view of the human past through studying the microbes that are uh, with humans. And today we'll be mainly focusing on pathogens and on microbiomes and just a little snippet about cuisine and diet at the end. And microbes are everywhere around us. Like you are literally covered in microbes. In fact, there are about as many bacterial cells in your body as there are human cells. So you are basically half microbe and half human, and they are everywhere. So, but unfortunately in the archeological record, a lot of the microbes will be decomposed. They will degrade as the soft tissues of the human body, for example, degrade after death. So it requires some quite specific conditions for us to be able to find the ancient microbes. And some of those are pictured here, for example, in teeth and in dental calculus and in bones and paleofeces and even in pot crusts. So basically a pots that have contained something that was cooking or foods or anything, we might also be able to find ancient microbes. But like I said, microbes are everywhere, which is actually a huge issue when you, we're studying ancient microbes, seeing as there is very little ancient DNA left. We have to be super careful not to introduce all of those modern microbes that are in us and on us and on every single surface everywhere. So you can see here in these pictures that both of them are actually me, one in a museum collection and one in the lab, that we're trying to very much cover every surface. We're constantly cleaning and we're trying to protect the samples from ourselves as much as possible to not get our microbes into the ancient samples you get very much used to the smell of bleach when you're working in the ancient lab. And now first I'm going to talk a little bit about ancient diseases. So during human history, a lot of our changes in lifestyle have exposed us to new pathogens, such as, for example, domesticated animals that allowed for a zoonosis, so um, animal diseases basically to jump over to humans. Also higher population densities in human populations made it easier to transmit the pathogens between each other. Also human mobility increased transmission between populations. And through all of this, we made it a lot easier for ourselves to get pathogens. And a lot of these past epidemics and disease outbreaks have been recorded either as various historical documents or as just mass graves. Uh, but often the cause is unknown, since we don't have a record of which bacterium was it that spread around this disease. 
And traditionally, this has been researched through paleopathology. So by looking at skeletal assemblages and seeing the traces that the diseases have caused on the skeletons. And this is still a huge part of what we do because it's basically the most reliable way to see that there has been a pathogen that killed a human if we see some sort of skeletal traces of it. And then in the 1990s, ancient DNA came into the picture. And in 2011, the first ancient pathogen genome was published, which was of Yersinia pestis, so the bacterium that is causing the plague. And since then, a lot of different pathogens have been um, studied. And here I'm just showing a few of the bacteria that have been studied so far. And you can see that it's both these really famous uh, past diseases and epidemics like leprosy and tuberculosis and cholera, as well as some of the slightly more, slightly less severe diseases that we still have going around currently, like ulcers and periodontal disease and syphilis. So a huge variety of bacteria that have been studied from the past as well as a few viruses like hepatitis, AIDS, influenza, and smallpox, and even eukaryotic pathogens like potato blight, which caused the Irish potato famine, as well as uh, the plasmodium species that caused malaria. And I would say that the most common place to find ancient pathogens are in the pulp cavity, since this is an area of the body that had blood flow while the human was alive. So bacteria were transported around in the bloodstream, got into the tooth, and then after death, this area is covered by dentin and protected, and also has a layer of enamel around it, which offers further protection. So it doesn't get quite as easily uh, colonized by environmental microbes. But you can also find uh, pathogens just in general bones, and of course in skeletal lesions caused by these pathogens. And I think you have already had lectures about how we process uh, next generation sequencing data from ancient individuals, but I will just quickly take you through this beautiful flow chart of how we process ancient pathogen DNA. So if we zoom in on the first part here. We start with uh, some type of tooth or bone or whatever it is we want to study the bacterium from. Then we extract total DNA from it, just everything that is in there, uh, pathogen, human, environmental microbes, contaminants, everything. And at that point, you can do a screening using qPCR, which is the arrow that goes off to the right there, where you basically design primers for a specific pathogen that you are interested in. And these primers will then anneal to the DNA from that pathogen and amplify it. And by that, you can check if the pathogen is in there or not. However, as you've also learned, Asian DNA is very broken and damaged, which means that this can be a bit unspecific and not sensitive enough sometimes. So then you can go and prepare a next generation sequencing library from it instead, which is there are going down. And then again, there is an alternative route to take where you would just directly capture the pathogens that you are interested in. If you have some type of a screening array, for example, with certain pathogens that you would want to capture. However, what we do here is mostly to go just directly to sequence this and then use computational methods to figure out who's in there. And there again, you have different routes you can take. If you think you know what it is, if you know what pathogen you're looking for, say, for example, you have a plague burial, you would probably think that it's your senior pestis that is in there that you're looking for. Then you would map this to a single reference or to maybe some closely related references as well and check how much DNA you have in there. Or if you have no clue what's in there, you just want to know, does this sample have anything cool in it? You would align these DNA sequences to a huge database of various bacteria, various microbes, and just check who's there. Is there anything interesting? And then the very important step, or step downwards from there is authentication. You really need to look at, the, is this actually ancient or is it some type of modern bacterium that I found instead? And then after that, you might want to go to a whole genome capture to increase the amount of pathogen DNA that you have in your sample, or just sequence deeper. So now to look at a little bit what we do with pathogen DNA, I'm going to go through two different case studies. First, I'll talk a little bit about plague, and then about an epidemic called the Kakalitsa. 
So I'm pretty sure that you've all heard about Plague. I even think that James talked about it, but we're gonna just go through a bit of background here quickly. So three big pandemics have been recorded of Plague. The first one was the Justinian Plague about 500 to 700 CE. Then the second one, perhaps the most famous one, the Black Death in the 1300s to 1700s. And then the third pandemic, which was around China in the 1800s. However, this is not just a disease of the past, it is actually still around. Just in 2020, there has here been a report of people dying from eating raw marmots and getting the plague. So it's definitely still a current day disease, just not in an epidemic or pandemic state anymore. And as I mentioned earlier, it is caused by a bacterium, Yersinia pestis. And what's interesting is that this bacterium is actually not adapted to humans at all. It is mainly found maintained in wild rodent populations. And as I mentioned, still has acti foci all over the world and is transmitted from rodent to rodent by fleas. And it actually has this really fascinating uh, way how it can do this. So if you look at the image, I can unfortunately not point because I'm not the one who's sharing the screen here. But if you look at the flea that is there in the middle, the bacterium will go to before its midgut and there form a biofilm, which will block the flea's gut passageways, basically. Which means that the flea will keep feeding more and more. It will feed, not be able to get the blood meal down to its midgut. So it will be starving. It will be feeding even more, feeding even more, and it will throw up the blood and it will be feeding even more, which is a great way to spread around the pathogen. However, what is not really clear yet is how it's jumped from uh, rodents to humans. There are theories about, for example, it just jumping directly from the rodent population to consumption of rodents, as in the example from Mongolia that I showed in the last slide, or perhaps it was somehow facilitated by the pets or other animals that are accompanying humans. So plague has three different types of manifestations in humans. The most common one is the bubonic plague, which is probably what you've heard about as well, which is where bacteria travel to the lymph nodes and cause these big swellings. They're called bubos, thereby the name bubonic plague. And I'm not gonna show you guys images of this. It is looking horrible. So if you want to see them, just Google them yourselves. I, I do not want to see that. And this form of the disease has up to 60% mortality if it is not treated. Now, currently, today you can treat it with antibiotics, but that was, of course, not the case for a large part of human history. Uh, the second form of plague is pneumonic plague, which is when bacteria have traveled to the lungs. And this is the one form where you can have human to human transmission. And this form has nearly 100% mortality if it's untreated. And then finally, we have septicemic plague, which is when it's spreading in the bloodstream, just everywhere in the body. And again, you are almost certain to die if you're not treated for plague at this point. Then if we jump to ancient DNA and what we've done so far with plague, this is a figure from a review that is actually at this point already two years old, which is showing all the ancient genomes, which are shown in uh, triangles on the map as well as all the modern genomes that have been sequenced, which are shown in the circles. And at this point, there was 38 published genomes in 2019. I would guess that today there is um, a lot more of them because this field is moving really fast forward at the moment. But as you can see, many of the ancient uh, genomes that are sequenced are from Europe and also from Asia. And by looking at all of these ancient genomes, people have been able to find out quite a lot about plague and its history. So if we just zoom in on the right side first. So Yersinia pestis uh, branched off from Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. And we know, we don't really know exactly when this happened, but we know it's definitely more than 5,000 years ago because we found plague in human remains from, that are about 5,000 years old. Now, the interesting thing in this first branch here, which contains uh, late Neolithic, Bronze Age, and Middle Neolithic individuals, is that it was actually not flea adapted yet. It wasn't able to colonize the flea gut and cause the blocking and everything that I told you about. And this has this form of the disease, um, 
This form of the bacterium is associated with bubonic plague, so probably also bubonic plague wasn't a thing back then. So this has opened up a lot of questions, like how was plague actually transmitted? And what was the host population? What we do know is that the, so place, the spread of plague sort of mirrors human migrations during this time. So perhaps it was something that was traveling alongside humans or some other way that humans mirror this uh, spread of plague. We don't really know, but hopefully in the coming years, as more and more genomes get, sequences, get sequenced, we will know more about this. Now, if we move on in time, in the time leading up to the first pandemic, we see that the genomes basically fall like, like pearls in a string after each other. And this is also where the flea adaptation has already occurred. Then if we open up the rest of the tree, we can see that first of all, all the modern genomes fall on these branches here. And also we can see that the second pandemic genomes so from the Black Death are falling on a branch quite far out, and then some genomes after the first, after the second pandemic are falling on the last branch. I can see that there are a lot of messages in the chat, but I will talk through this slide and then look at the messages. So basically to summarize about the plague, what we've learned from ancient genomes is that we've learned a lot of things about the transmission of plague. We've learned about cis virulence and its evolution and adaptation. So perhaps we can also learn some lessons for current or future pathogens. And there is still a lot to be learned. As you notice, there are still a lot of open questions, but as genomes are constantly being sequenced more and more, hopefully we will in the coming, year, coming years have lots of responses as well. So next up, we will talk a little bit about the Kokolitsli epidemic. So this uh, epidemic is quite poorly understood but it had a mortality of about 60 to 90 percent. And the name Kogulitsli actually means pestilence in Nahuatl, which is an Aztec language. And it is one of the three big epidemics of this area. This area being central Mexico, where it started and then spread out around Mesoamerica. And there are actually quite a lot of indigenous sources that are depicting this epidemic, which is why we know some of the uh, traits of this disease, which were full body rashes and vomiting and nosebleeds, which is also depicted here in the picture on the right hand side. However, we don't really know what the cause was. There are many pictures and descriptions of it, but of course there is no description of which bacterium caused it. So there have been a lot of guesses, for example, typhoid fever, epidemic typhus, plague, influenza, and hemorrhagic fever, but up until recently, we just didn't know what was causing it. And by recently, I mean in 2018, when Osil Bogene and colleagues here from the MPI uh, looked at one, uh, one coccolitely associated burial here in Mexico in a mixtec area. And this is a very interesting burial because it contains both pre-contact and post-contact individuals. And they took this approach of sequencing everything and mapping it to a big database to just find out everything what was in there. And as you can see, they have on the left hand there a bunch of post-contact individuals. So after Europeans have been in contact with this area, as well as a few pre-contact individuals and a soil sample to control for environmental colonization of bacterium. And what stood out to them was that in the post-contact individuals, there was this bacterium Salmonella enterica which was not found in any of the pre-contact individuals and also not in the soil. So if we take the full name of what they found, it is Salmonella enterica subspecies enterica cerebar parathyphy C, but let's just call it Salmonella enterica from now on. So what this bacterium causes is enteric fever and not a huge amount of known about the past of this disease, but we do know that infected individuals shed bacteria after the symptoms and that there are asymptomatic carriers, which we all in the current day know are really bad things for the spread of an epidemic. So to summarize, this is a case where there was an epidemic that we did not know what was causing it, 
but I managed to find some molecular evidence for what it may have been uh, through the study of ancient DNA. Now, as you may have noticed, I said may have been, because we do need a little bit more research to actually say definitely what this was. As you saw, there was very few individuals from just one single cemetery. So it's very intriguing first evidence of what it may have been, but we do need to get more individuals to say anything. But it is cool that we are able to solve this sort of ancient mysteries of ancient epidemics using ancient DNA, and hopefully also connected with other lines of evidence, such as these historical depictions of the disease. And then over to Irina with the microbiome. Okay, so now we're going to switch from talking about single organisms to talking about whole collections of organisms all at once. Maybe not, there we go. Okay, so what is a microbiome? Well, that's actually a collection of a whole bunch of microorganisms living and growing all together at once. Frequently they grow in what are called biofilms where you have many, uh -oh, many organisms all growing together very closely and they interact with each other very closely. And so they produce a whole bunch of molecules and actually a microbiome is both the bacteria and viruses and other microorganisms, as well as all of these molecules that they are producing together. And these include, of course, their own DNA and proteins and small molecule metabolites, which they keep both inside the cell and those that they secrete outside of the cells to interact with other bacterium and microorganisms, as well as with the host, such as the humans that are carrying these. One really clear and obvious example of a microbiome is dental plaque, which calcifies during life to form dental calculus, which is a common microbiome found in the archaeological record that I'll be talking about today. So where can we find archaeological microbiomes? No, nope, this is not happy. Okay, so uh, one place that we can look for them is in ancient latrines. And these are good places to look for examples of the kinds of parasites that were present in populations in the past. We can't unfortunately get specific individual information because latrines are usually used by many people, but it can give us an overall population view of what was present. Then we can also look at paleo feces. These are usually very dried out feces which can represent the intestinal gut microbiome. There are bones and teeth that carry microbiomes. These are not really heavily studied for microbiome research because largely they contain microbes that represent what's in the soil, but they can also contain microbes that were involved in decomposing the bodies after death, which is part of the necrobiome. So that's the collection of microorganisms involved in decomposition. Dental calculus, which is a calcified dental plaque on the tooth surfaces is a really good representation of the oral microbiome. And then you can also get microbiomes related to food and drink production in pottery if it sticks to the sides of the vessels. And, and then you can also get microbiomes out of preserved specimens such as those that have been collected in hospitals and pickled basically and kept in preserving fluids, although those are not very um, heavily studied right now, and we don't know too much about how well they actually do preserve microbiomes, but they are available and people are starting to look into what they can provide. So how do we study microbiomes? This is very similar to the next-gen sequencing um, information that James gave yesterday. There's just a slight extra step at the end. So for example, we would collect dental calculus off of a tooth and we would perform extraction and library building in the lab. And then we would sequence this and get at the end our FASTQ file with our sequencing data that represents reads from the microbes that are in ancient dental calculus. And then we would take this FASTQ file and we would put it into a taxonomic profiler, which is a database that's full of all kinds of known species. And then it will go and it will map the reads in our FASTQ file against all of these known species genomes. And it will try to identify where each read comes from. And in the end, it will put out a table that looks something like this, where we have a list of species and a list of all of the samples that we have. And it'll give you a count of the number of reads that map to each species within each sample. And then we do most of our analysis using this table. And we assume that this table is approximately representative of the original biofilm, such as that came from our dental calculus sample. Now, the two most common microbiomes that we find in the archaeological record are paleofeces and ancient dental calculus. So I'll be talking mostly about those two substrates today. 
starting with ancient dental calculus, which is what I mostly work with. This is a mineralized dental plaque. It forms on the tooth surfaces and it's quite abundant in the archeological record. Um, you can find it through deep time and across the world. So it's, uh, it's pretty much a ubiquitous substrate within the archeological record. Dental plaque is associated with two major human diseases, dental cavities and periodontitis or gum disease. And so it's interesting for us to be able to study this, this biofilm that is associated with diseases and how this biofilm and the diseases that it's associated with may have changed through time relating to changes in human activities or um, human interactions. Now this, it turns out what we're finding from our studies of ancient dental calculus is that it's actually quite a stable human microbiome. It does not change um, very dramatically across deep time or across geography. So this is in contrast to other microbiomes. Now, what does dental calculus look like on a tooth? It looks very, very similar actually to modern dental plaque. So here we have an electron micrograph image of a tooth that's been cross-sectioned. So it was cut through the center and we have here enamel and then here's the dentin and the tooth root here. And this little bit sticking off is dental calculus. And if we zoom in, we can start to see that it looks like it's formed of layers. And if we zoom in a lot, you can see that indeed there are a lot of layers here. And so this was a nice evidence that what we have here is a very, structured and layered biofilm, which forms in layers. So you get an early deposition of bacteria, they grow up and then something causes it to calcify. And then on top of that, you get new layers of bacteria forming. And then at some point that calcifies over and it repeats over and over and over. And you get this eventual buildup of this, in some cases, very thick deposits of dental calculus. And this preserved the cells and other bio, well, the biomolecules in the cells very, very well such that you can actually even stain these uh, calculus samples using common uh, microbial stains. So in this case, we have a gram stain where it's stained to uh, indicate what kind of cell wall these bacteria have. So pink versus purple. And within the purple, you can actually see some distinct cell shapes and within the pink, you can see some dots. So this shows us that this calcified matrix that's encasing all of these bacteria, which are once living on the tooth surface is preserving it in a state that's really, really um, accurately preserved and it, and it maintains the biomolecule integrity quite well. So the first study to do shotgun sequencing of ancient dental calculus, it compared the species profile. So all of the different microorganisms that are in there between ancient calculus and modern plaque and found that there's a whole lot of overlap. In fact, most of the species that you find in ancient calculus, you can also find in modern plaque. And it, we didn't use, or the study didn't use modern calculus because at the time there was only sequencing data from modern plaque. It turns out modern calculus is quite uncommon to find, but when you do find it, it looks an awful lot like what you see on archeological specimens. So the morphology of that just hasn't changed over time. Some of the species that you can identify in ancient dental calculus are associated with diseases today, particularly periodontal disease. And these included species such as Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is pictured here, Tenorella forsythia, which is pictured here, and Treponema denticola, which is pictured here. And this tells us that these species then have been with us for quite a long time through human history, and have probably been associated with disease for a very long time as well. Now, there was another study that came out recently that was interested in looking at, well, just how long have the species in our oral microbiome been associated with humans and the human lineage? And this study decided to look at a dental calculus that came off of apes and ancient humans compared to modern humans to see what has been preserved through time and what has changed through time and how might these differences be associated with changes in diet or changes in lifestyle and human evolution and human adaptation. So what they did was they profiled the calculus and they looked at the species within all of these different groups. They had howler monkeys, gorillas, chimpanzees, Neanderthals and ancient and modern humans. And what they found is that for the most part, all of the species that you can detect in these um, samples are quite similar. They're shared across samples. So here, this is a heat map showing a bunch of different bacterial species that were found within the, the dental calculus samples. And then it turns out that the species tend to cluster by the host that the samples came from. So howler monkeys and gorillas had a lot of shared taxa that were unique to themselves. For example, this group here was abundant within, within the gorillas and the howler monkeys, but it was largely absent from the humans and the chimpanzees. Whereas the chimpanzees here, 
also have a, a, an individual set of taxa that seem to be quite specific to them. These are highly abundant here, but not present within the humans and not present within the gorillas or the howler monkeys. And then humans have this big chunk of taxa down here, which are largely specific to the humans and not found in chimpanzees. Although curiously, they are found in gorillas and howler monkeys. But for the most part, what we saw was that the taxa are shared between all of these groups. So this tells us that at least through human evolution, there have been a lot of conservation of this collection of species. There's something about them that causes them to work really well together. So even through changes in diet, through changes in jaw morphology, through changes in hygiene status, particularly recently with industrial um, industrialization and increasing dental care, there's something about these species that causes them to really stick together and to not be easily disrupted and switched out basically um, through time. And it turns out that if we look at individual species within the oral microbiome of these individuals, we also see quite a similar pattern. So in this case, instead of looking at the entire species collection, which is a common uh, first approach within um, microbiome work, the authors pulled out individual species from the microbiome to look at and to see whether or not the evolution of these three individual species looked like it mirrors the evolution or the evolutionary trajectories of their hosts. So what these phylogenies are showing is that this, for example, Actinomyces dentalis that came from howler monkeys tend to cluster together. The ones that came from chimpanzees tend to cluster together, but they do cluster with the gorillas. And then those with the humans tend to cluster together. And there doesn't seem to be much difference between the modern human samples and the Neanderthal samples, which are in light orange. And this is a pattern that was shared between all of the different species that we see. So this tells us that both collectively, these communities are quite stable through time, but individually they are evolving with their hosts. So the way that these species are evolving is in a way that is not affecting their community behavior. So that's probably why the, we don't see massive changes through human evolution within the oral microbiome. Now, in addition to DNA, yeah, so all of this work is based on DNA that was extracted from dental calculus, but you can also get a whole variety of other molecules out of dental calculus. And using these other molecules, you can study a whole range of other things. So for example, the biofilms are very metabolically active. All of the bacteria are happily bubbling along, producing whatever they need to produce. You've also got all of the metabolites in saliva that come from whatever your cells are producing and anything that you're eating. And you've also got metabolites that are being secreted by the gingival tissues. And this is all mixed up within the mouth. And any of this and all of this can get embedded within the biofilm and calcified and held within the biofilm itself. And so you've also got this potential to look at metabolites and proteins that are in the biofilm to get an idea of what are these species actually doing when they're interacting with each other and when they're interacting with the host tissue. And this is a, a particularly interesting approach that you can take with microbiome research that's much harder to do with other um, ancient DNA research, because this can actually give us an idea of, of metabolic activity, which is what we're seeing in, in microbiome research, much more important to understand than just which species are present. Because it turns out a lot of different species can do the same things, and it's really what they're doing that's causing disease. So it doesn't matter who's doing it, as long as somebody is, then it can cause disease or it can maintain health. And so you can look at this by looking at the um, metabolite profile and the protein profile. So in the ancient dental calculus, you can get proteins from both humans and from the bacteria. And so this is a, an interaction network showing human proteins in light blue and bacterial proteins in dark blue. And it shows that there are co-occurrences of certain human proteins with certain bacterial proteins in dental calculus, which suggests that certain bacterial proteins may stimulate production of certain human proteins, in particular um, immune response related proteins, because the bacteria are trying to invade the soft host tissues and the host, of course, doesn't want the bacteria to invade and cause disease. And so it mounts an immune response to try to fight them off. And so you can try to get an understanding of, at a, at a more detailed molecular level, what is going on within your biofilm and host interactions through time and see whether or not changes in human evolution and human activities have somehow altered these to perhaps throw off the balance to promote disease more or how, how things have actually been held stable through time and what is really useful to know to try to maintain for health. And then further, you can also look at 
mo uh, small molecule metabolites within ancient dental calculus. And these are things like small amino acids, lipids, small carbohydrates, and anything that would basically be produced by any cell that's living. And these, there are certain categories of metabolites that preserve better in dental calculus through time than others. And so if you are doing targeted me metabolomics approaches with this, then it's good to keep in mind that you may not be able to detect certain metabolites, um, particularly those that you might find particularly interesting from modern studies, you'd have to make sure that they actually do preserve through time. But there are a wide variety that do. And within these, you can actually use the metabolite profiles to distinguish different characteristics of the samples that you have um, in the same way that you would do with modern data. So you might be able to look in the past and see, well, if we have samples from teeth that all have caries versus teeth that don't have caries, what metabolites are associated with caries historically and look at whether those metabolites are associated with caries in individuals living today and try to get an understanding of, of whether development of caries has become more severe or less severe or has any in any way changed through time. And the same with uh, periodontitis. It's also kind of interesting that you can distinguish between males and females or samples from males and females and samples from different age groups. But these are also related to probably differences in host physiology more than the, in the biofilm. And it's just interesting to know that if you wanted to get into that kind of research, you could potentially look into those kinds of things as well. And now um, I'll switch over to paleofeces. These are feces that have been preserved under very, very dry conditions. Usually they're very arid or very salty. And it's much less common to find in the archaeological record than a dental calculus because dental calculus is essentially a mineral that forms during life. And so once somebody dies, it's basically the equivalent of a tooth or a bone and it can't be broken down, whereas paleofeces are still a soft tissue and they will be rapidly degraded by microorganisms in the soil or wherever, um, unless they are quickly dried out so that they can't be broken down. But paleofeces are a demonstration of a highly variable human microbiome in contrast to the oral microbiome. Now there's a lot of interest today in gut research and gut microbiome research and associating this with changes in human hygiene and in the differences between rural humans and urban humans and how has um, urbanization and industrialization affected the microbiome because this is considered to be a key point for promoting what are called non well non-communicable inflammatory diseases so diseases of industrialization so modern studies have demonstrated that uh, rural human gut feces or gut microbiomes fecal microbiomes show a distinct species profile compared to urban human uh, fecal samples and there's a lot of un interest in understanding what changes have led to the urban microbiome, which is associated with a lot of inflammatory diseases. So if we study paleofeces, then we can look through time, when do these changes happen? So particularly within countries that have become industrialized um, in the past relative to those that are currently industrializing, and we can try to understand what drives the changes. So this study includes paleofeces samples that were collected from uh, Mexico, from Iran, and from Austria. And it wanted to, um, so this is a, a, an ongoing study in our group uh, by another postdoc that we work with. And he's trying to compare these paleofeces samples, which are all from roughly contemporaneous time periods, to both industrial and non-industrial modern samples to try to see what the differences are and when have changes occurred in the in deep time within the gut microbiome. One of the very important things that you have to do with a microbiome sample um, that is not, not quite the same as in um, individual species studies is to make sure that what you're working with is actually really well preserved because these microbiomes can easily be broken down by soil organisms and they can be contaminated by anything that's on your skin during handling. You wanna make sure that the samples that you're working with are not contaminated, that they're really well preserved, that they're good reflections of the original sample. And so one of the ways to do this is to compare the species profile to known potential contaminant sources, and then the potential source that you actually hope that your sample is from. So in this case, we have paleofeces that we hope look a lot like the gut, 
but they may be contaminated by skin so, uh, samples or skin microbes during handling and excavation. They may be contaminated by soil because they're deposited on the ground. Um, we also look at calculus just as something else to throw in there. So what we see in this is it shows that the, uh, the proportion of your sample that looks like any of the given sources. And in this case, most of the paleo PC samples mostly look like gut, which shows that they're quite well preserved, which is a good thing because if you don't have good preservation, you really can't study your sample. You have to throw it out if it looks mostly like soil. It's not gonna tell you anything. And so here the samples in this study are quite well preserved, which is really good meant that you could compare them quite well and quite directly to modern samples. And one of the ways that we compare our samples, our species profiles to modern samples or to other sample types is to perform a PCA. And for this, it takes the sample species profile and it says, how similar is it to the next sample species profile and the next sample species profile and the next and the next. And then it calculates coordinates, which we can plot. And if the samples group closer together on the PCA, it means they have a more similar species profile. And if they plot more distantly, it means they have a more distinct species profile. So this is a way that we can get a nice visual of what samples look most like each other. And so in this PCA, we have a bunch of samples all clustering together here. And it turns out that these are from both modern and ancient feces samples. So that's good. They all look quite similar. Out here, we have soil samples, which are quite distinct, which uh, we saw from the last slide. We have quite good preservation of our paleo feces samples. If they looked more like soil, if they weren't as well preserved, we would expect to see them plotting somewhere um, in the middle of these two, or perhaps entirely with the soil samples. And then we also have skin samples, which are plotting quite distinctly from our gut samples, which is again good if we had skin uh, microbiome contaminating our gut samples, then they would pull over to the skin and they would plot more here. And then calculus, which is always quite distinct from the other three sources. And so this is a way of assuring ourselves that indeed we do have really well-preserved feces and they do look like modern samples, so we can directly compare them. Now, these plots are actually multidimensional. So if you imagine that this is, you're actually looking straight on at a cube, the first one, you just take this and you rotate it 90 degrees, and then you would see that it spreads out and it shows you what you're looking at in the second PC, um, PCA here. And in this case, it shows this cluster is what we can't see, it, it's actually spreading out back. And if we turn it, then you can see that there's uh, spread in the third dimension. And along this spread here, we see that the modern samples separate out a little bit. So we have industrial samples here. These are from modern US and it, um, individuals living in Italy. And then we have uh, non-industrial modern samples in purple. These are from individuals living in Africa and Mexico. And then we have our ancient samples, which are clustering farthest to the right here. And it's interesting that these cluster farthest to the right, it means that they are more similar to the non-industrial human gut samples than they are to the industrial gut samples. So these are representing basically a non-industrial profile, um, a, a genuine historic non-industrial profile, which looks a lot like the non-industrial profiles that we're seeing in people living today. So we may be able to look at what these similarities are between these two and what differences are to try to understand um, in a, a populations that were living before global industrialization started happening, what sorts of species are here, what's associated with disease and not uh, compared to individuals who are living in, in currently industrializing populations, basically, to try to understand what may drive the species profiles we see in these individuals to be more similar to these individuals. So then the last thing that they we have here is a heat map showing the different species that were detected within all of these samples. Um, and all of the samples are lined up here. And what we see is that there are certain species that are differently abundant between the different sample types. So here we have the modern industrial samples in purple, the modern non-industrial samples in orange, and in uh, brown we have our ancient or paleo PC samples. And we can see that within the uh, species over here, there's a whole group that don't seem to be all that commonly found within our modern industrial samples. So these are species that are largely lost or not carried by people living in highly industrialized countries today. But it turns out they were quite abundantly found in non-industrial populations living today. 
as well as in the past within our paleo PC samples. So these are something species that have become lost, presumably along with industrialization, because they were within these populations living in the same areas prior to industrialization. And in contrast, there's a whole set of species here. So red is more abundant, blue is less abundant. There's a whole set of species here that appear to be much more abundant within the industrial populations than within the non-industrial populations or the ancient populations. So this tells that there's something about an industrial lifestyle that promotes the growth and abundance of these species compared to say these species. Um, these species. And it would be worth investigating why we see a loss of these species um, in industrial samples and a growth of these species in industrial samples. How does this relate to changes in diet or in hygiene or in living conditions? And what sorts of effects do these have on our health? And is it worth trying to mediate these changes and to try to maybe reintroduce these species or to try to adapt our diets more to be compatible with what we currently have so that we're not basically disrupting the microbes and, and making them produce molecules that then in, uh, promote inflammation within our cells that promotes disease. So some basic take home points from the microbiomes. They do preserve in the archeological record and there's quite a wide variety of sources for them, but there are really only two that have been intensely studied at this point. They contain information about microbial taxonomy. So this is what you get out of the DNA, but they also contain information about microbial activity, which is what you can get from studying proteins and metabolites within your microbiome samples. They do reflect host changes uh, depending on the microbiome source. So feces reflect host changes, the oral microbiome not so much. And they may help us understand historic health and disease and long-term changes um, in health and disease relating to changes in the human condition, which might otherwise not be detectable just by looking at human genetics. Oh, and Xander will tell you now about microbiomes in cuisine. Sorry. Yes, if I can get my remote control to actually work. Yes, great. So um, yes, microbes are in us and on us and pretty much everywhere, but we also eat a lot of them. Things that we all know and love like wine and beer and sourdough bread and cheese are essential to have microbes to produce. And also some slightly more specific things like the lovely Swedish Sustroming and kimchi are actually fermented using microbes. So whether you want it or not, you're eating a lot of microbes all of the time. However, today I will tell you about one of the mysteries that have to do with ancient diets, which is dairy. So a lot of people around the world consume dairy as quite a large part of their diet. And as infants, as you probably know, we all produce lactose to digest the lactase in, in, the, in dairy. But we gradually stop producing this as we grow up. And this is in our genes, it's genetically uh, determined. So it has nothing to do with our environment or diet or anything. Just our genetics tell us to stop producing lactase as we grow up. But still, a lot of people all around the world consume dairy as a very large part of their diet. In fact, we can also find a lot of evidence of dairy in the archaeological record. Like, for example, this lovely lady here from early Bronze Age China, around 2000 to 1500 BC, who has uh, a cheese necklace, which is quite an amazing thing, in my opinion. And also, we can track the spread of dairying and using animals for dairying purposes by studying dental calculus, because the proteins in dairy quite often gets incorporated into dental calculus and get preserved over very long time periods. And so the question is then, why can people eat dairy although they are not able to degrade lactose? And you probably all heard about the mutations in our genome that give us so-called lactase persistence. So we keep producing lactase as we grow up. But as I'm showing here, these maps are of one of the alleles that are linked to lactase persistence. You can see that through time and also today, quite large areas have very low lactase persistence. And one such area is, for example, around Mongolia. Irina, maybe you can just flutter the cursor above Mongolia. <laughs> 
close enough. <laughs> yes, you can see that true time, there's quite low lactose persistence there, but we know that true time people are consuming a lot of dairy in this area. So it's lactose persistence, yes, gives us the ability to digest dairy as we grow up, but in large parts of the world, this is not a huge thing. So that's not the only reason why people can consume dairy as adults. Now, another theory is that perhaps microbes or cooking can remove lactose from dairy products, as microbes can digest this lactose. However, what we found out through looking at, for example, dairy products from Mongolia, is that they still contain a lot of lactose, even after they have been produced to their final forms, they still have a lot of lactose. So this is also unlikely to be it. So finally, the attention has to be turned into the gut microbiome. If it does not like this persistence, so our genetics, and it's not that we move the lactose from the products that they eat, then the gut microbiome is a very logical uh, answer. Seeing as this is actually what causes the issues with lactose intolerance in the first place, as the gut microbiome digests the lactose and produces uh, gases, which causes it to be very uncomfortable. So what then happens if your gut microbiome adapts to a lactose or a dairy-based diet? Well, we actually don't know. This is still an open question. And the only reason I wanted to talk, talk to you about this is that it's ongoing research and it's really cool and we really do not know the answer to it. But in our group, we're trying to, with a large amount of collaborators, combine areas like archaeogenetics, paleoproteomics, ethnography, modern microbiology, archaeology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to try and figure out this both ancient and modern day mystery of why do people consume dairy without being able to consume dairy. So by combining these different areas of research, we're hoping to get as holistic a view as possible. And perhaps by getting all of these little pieces of the puzzle, we'll be able to put them together and see what is the answer to this mystery. So my conclusion here is basically stay tuned. We're doing some quite awesome research at the moment that we don't know what the answer is going to really be, but hopefully in some years, you will be able to read our papers and, or perhaps participate in this type of research and figure it out. So to conclude this lecture, Microbes are awesome. I think it's the most important uh, take home message here. They're quite abundant in the archeological record. We can find out many different things from many different types of microbes and microbiomes. And we can use various biomolecular techniques to identify them and to look at them. And they can tell us about very many aspects of the human past. <laughs>